السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله رب العالمين all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Lord of the worlds nourisher cherisher sustainer provider protector curer of one and all the one in whose hands lies absolute control of every single aspect of existence. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala afdal al khalqi ajma'in nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa tabi'in wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin. Complete blessings and salutations be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household without exception, all his companions without exception. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every one of us, those who have followed in the proper way. May Allah make us from among them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our offspring, those to come up to the end of time. May Allah keep us steadfast on the deen. Ameen. My brothers and sisters in Islam and my brothers and sisters in humanity, it is indeed a beautiful evening. We will be discussing one of the most important pillars of Islam. Normally, we are taught that there are five pillars in Islam. I'm sure you've heard that before. You would have to know it, in fact, if you are a Muslim. Five pillars based on the hadith. One of them is the hadith known as Hadith Jibreel, alayhi salam, where Jibreel, the Prophet, or should I say, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, had a visitor and a guest who came to sit in front of him and in the presence of the companions. May, may Allah be pleased with all of them. This man was dressed in white and nobody knew him. And at the same time, there was no sign that he had made a journey. Now, if nobody knows a person, people would think that he is coming from far away. So there would be a few signs showing on his clothing or perhaps he would look tired and so on that he is coming from a distance. But this man, unique. He had black hair and he was wearing white clothing and no one knew him and there was no sign that he had made a journey and he comes in front of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he sat down do you know at the end of our prayer salah how we sit just before we say the salam it's known as al-qa'da or tashahud al-akhir or the tashahud when we are sitting in that sitting position he came to sit right in front of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so close that if I were to sit like that with you, or you were to sit like that with me, you or I may be intimidated. Because the knees were touching each other's, literally. And then he says, Oh Muhammad. Imagine, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by his name. He says, tell me what is Islam. Tell me. I want to know what is Islam. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship but Allah and to bear witness that I am the messenger. That is the bearing of witness, the utterance, the declaration. That is the first pillar of Islam and to fulfill the prayer. This is speaking about the five obligatory prayers to fulfill these. That's the second pillar and to fast in the month of Ramadan or to give your charities to fast in the month of Ramadan and to go for the pilgrimage to Mecca. Whoever is able to do that. Those are the five pillars. So this man says, you have spoken the truth. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum companions who were around, they were surprised. He's asking a question and himself, he is saying, yes, you are speaking the truth. You are speaking the truth. Imagine if you asked your teacher, tell me what is this sum and you gave them or you gave your teacher something very, very difficult. And the teacher gives you an answer because the teacher knows the answer just like this. And you say, you know what? You're right. It seems like you're the teacher now, doesn't it? So this is what happened. Now I'm going to pause there. The rest of the hadith is important and I'd like you to go through it because it mentions various other questions that were asked by Jibreel alayhi salam to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Later on when he went away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked his companions, do you know who this was? And they said, Allah and his messenger know best. He says, this was Jibreel. He came in order to teach you your deen, your, your religion. Subhanallah. And from this we learn that to ask questions, in fact, would serve as a means of learning for those who listen to the questions and the answers. 
It's very interesting and very important. So at the end, they found out who it was. They were intrigued, interested. Because imagine if you were told that there was an angel in your midst. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I want to tell you, there are angels right now recording what we are doing, surrounding us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning us to the angels as well. Because the hadith, the Prophet peace be upon him's narration says, whoever gathers in order to listen to something that is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are surrounded by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels surround them, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of them to the angels who are there with him, and so on. So it's a beautiful narration giving us the virtue of those who are sacrificing in order to learn something to do with gaining closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So getting back to this narration, one of the pillars that was made mention of was as salah. What is the meaning of salah? To start off, you need to know that the English language does not qualify to translate the Arabic language because the term prayer, if I were to tell someone who's not a Muslim to pray, they might clasp their hands and begin to supplicate, right? That is a supplication. We would call it dua. So if you say dua, they say pray. I prayed for you. I am praying for you. That means I'm supplicating for you. I'm asking Allah something for you. I am making dua for you. That's what we say as well. So let's not confuse it. When we say prayer, there is a definite difference between supplication and the five daily prayers that we are speaking about as one of the pillars of Islam. So one might ask, why is it such a pillar of Islam? Why is it so important? To be honest, because the Almighty has decided to give it importance, so it shall be important. Like the Hajj. One might say, why is it a pillar of Islam? Well, Allah chose to make it a pillar of Islam. If you understand or you do not understand the benefits of it, you still need to fulfill it because you will call yourself a Muslim. If you are calling yourself a Muslim, you will understand that I need to surrender. I need to surrender. Now I'd like to ask you a question. We are seated here, mashallah. We were given birth to. And alhamdulillah, we grew up. We saw a few years. We are wearing clothing. We have eyes. We have ears, mashallah. We are breathing fresh air. We have electricity. We have so much. Who bestowed us with all this? Isn't it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What has He taken from you in return? Did He tell you for every breath you need to pay one cent? Even if we were told that for every breath you need to pay one tenth of a cent, that means for every ten breaths you take, you will pay one cent, we would all be bankrupt. Do you know that? We would be bankrupt. Imagine for a heartbeat. When something is wrong with your heart, you are fearing to lose or to skip a single beat. You would pay as much as the money that is required in order for you to check your heart out, to make sure you don't skip a single beat, because that can create or cause a lot of medical problems and you could die as a result, right? So if Allah charged you for that heartbeat, would you be able to pay? The truth is, those who are wealthy will say, look, I don't mind paying, my health comes first. What's the point of me having $10 million and I'm not alive? So people will pay that $10 million in order to have their heart pumping, in order to be able to breathe. You know, there are people who live on a respirator or a respirator and a, a, a machine that they will put on, ventilator, for example, sometimes what we would term life support. And they keep on financing it because they have the money to do that. Just because they want to remain alive. So you and I are seated here. None of us is on this ventilation. May Allah grant cure to those who are sick and ill. Those who may be listening to us from the live stream as well. Those who may be in their beds and bedridden. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you miraculous cure. My brothers and sisters, Allah has asked us for very little compared to what He has given us. In the Quran He says, if you are to try and count the favors of Allah upon you, you will never be able to complete them. You won't be able to count them in totality. Indeed, man is oppressive and he is at the same time ungrateful the term kafar here refers to people who are ungrateful they show ingratitude allah gave you so much you're ungrateful 
We have children, mashallah. We have marriages, alhamdulillah. We have parents, alhamdulillah. Some of us, we may have lost one of these or we may not have one of them, but we have so much, so many other things that we need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask us to do? Not much. One of the things is to fulfill your prayer unto him five times a day. Not only does it increase your discipline. I have had instances where I have had to fulfill my own prayer in an airport in one of the Western countries. And I recall at that time, people came up to me and told me how fascinated they were by the movements that I was making and how serene and calm it was. Imagine you go down into the bowing position and you're facing a specific direction. They can tell that you're actually not facing the corner or something. It's a specific direction you have faced and you are calm and you're so cool and you go down in sajda, in prostration. It is so soothing to the eye of the onlooker if you are to fulfill it correctly. So those who witness the movements and the actions of salah, are confirming that it is soothing. It is something I would like to do. I know of some non-Muslims who've told me that we have tried out these positions on our own just to see what it feels like. Subhanallah, amazing. And here we are, Muslimin, and we are lacking when it comes to the fulfillment of the salah. So it's not just the physical benefit. It's not just the medical benefit. When your Subhanallah, when your physiotherapist tells you that you need to exercise, you need to stretch, you need to turn this way, that way, bend your back, make it sure it's straight, you know, your hamstrings and this, everyone likes to listen because they don't want something to go wrong. Salah is not an exercise, but you will automatically be able to gain that health aspect of your body by fulfilling your salah correctly. So when Allah says fulfill your salah, and when the method is displayed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, neither do we fulfill it, nor do we want to learn the proper method of that salah. When you do your ruku'ah, do it properly. You should try your best to have your back as straight as possible. And you will feel your body being stretched. You are not doing it in order to stretch your back or your spine or anything else. You are actually doing it in order to obey the instruction of Allah through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Obviously, he brought the message. But at the same time, the perks of it, that you will inshallah be able to achieve a lot in terms of health, in terms of your own exercise and what have you, that's a secondary matter. It's not the intention of our salah. A person who only intends exercise, definitely they don't get a reward for that salah. It's not proper fulfillment of that salah. So don't get me wrong. But the point I'm raising is, there are so many other benefits of that salah, yet we are not... We are not obedient to Allah's instruction. Whereas when medicine tells us something similar, we are quick to rush because we don't want to become unhealthy. Who is the owner of health? Is it not Allah? Well, Allah gave you this as a gift. He told you to get up early in the morning. The timing of that prayer is a recipe to success. The West will tell you early to bed, early to rise. What happens to such a person? Makes John or Jack healthy, wealthy and wise. Well, if Jack or John becomes healthy, wealthy and wise, what do you think Abdullah will become? Subhanallah. He will become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on top of the health and the wealth and the wisdom. Because he's getting up so early and he sleeps after Salatul Isha. You and I know that if you do not have something constructive to do after the night prayer, go to bed. Some of the children will tell you what I'm on WhatsApp for the for three hours at least. Why? Sitting with Facebook for the, for two and a half hours, especially those who are married and your spouse is next to you. When you want to communicate, she has to send you a message on Messenger. She could have poked you just like this, but no, times have changed, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May He make us people who are real. May He make us learn and understand the limitations of the use of technology. Because when we get carried away and when we lose the limits, we definitely begin to oppress ourselves as well as others. So imagine when medicine or when the West tells you about getting up early, then people start quoting it to say, wow, you got to get up early. Why? Because I want to be a healthy person. Take a look at the leaders of certain nations and so on. If you know some of their lives, they are disciplined people. 
part of discipline, my beloved youth, my brothers and sisters, is to be able to forsake your sleep and, in, and to get up on time. It's part of discipline. So Allah provides that for you and gives you a bonus, a reward for it and tells you, you will actually earn paradise by fulfilling it over and above the bonus of you having been disciplined on earth to be able to achieve. Nobody who sleeps up to 12 o'clock every single day or who's, who doesn't get up until almost Dhuhr or the afternoon can call themselves successful. That's not success. When the call to prayer is called, you and I know, what do we hear? Allah does not just say, Hayya ala salah should be said in the adhan. But on top of that, there is another statement that is uttered. Hayya ala al-falah. Doesn't it remind you of Mecca? Subhanallah. Do you know what? It's a beautiful call to what? To success. You want to succeed. I want to succeed. We all want to succeed. And the call to success is made five times a day, but we do not respond. And we still want success. Foolish. Did you hear that? The call to success. Allah tells you, okay, I know you want success. And in the eyes of Allah, success is not just money. No. Success is to do with the dunya and the akhirah. Allah gives you contentment. Allah gives you barakah and blessings in what you have. And the call is called out five times a day minimum. Beautiful nation like this. You can hear the adhan from more than one place. Subhanallah, the call to success is made by the instruction of the owner of success. And we who are hunting for success, it, it actually is so loud in our ears, but we are nowhere near responding to that call. And we still want success. That's foolish. This is why my brothers and sisters spare a moment to think. Allah has given you a gift. Salah was actually a gift. This afternoon we spoke on the topic at Jumu'ah. And I mentioned something very interesting. If you consider salah as a burden, you still have not fulfilled it in the correct way. As a believer, male or female, the day you consider salah a gift and an honor, that is the day that you have arrived at a level whereby you've understood what the salah is all about. A lot of us consider it a burden, especially Salatul Fajr, the cold winter nights, subhanallah, the warm, cozy duvet over you, mashallah. And at the same time, you have a beautiful set of pyjamas, alhamdulillah. And then you are worried about the cold water that is in the tap. And thereafter, you feel that, okay, there is still a few minutes left for Salatul Fajr. And what do you do? You hit snooze. When you hit snooze, what happens? You lose. You snooze, you lose. You know that. Subhanallah. So don't hit snooze. A true believer considers it an honor. The first time the alarm rings, I challenge you to be able to sit up and read your adhkar. Praise Allah. Thank Him for the sleep He's given you and for getting you up in the morning and get up and get along and get on with your wudu and your salah. That's a challenge. May Allah help me to improve myself. And then every one of us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So my brothers and sisters, Imagine if you were to get up only for the sake of Allah and you say, Oh Allah, I love my sleep. Oh Allah, I love this duvet of mine. I love the bedding, the mattress. I just love the warmth here. And Ya Allah, it's so difficult for me to get up and to get into this cold and turn on the tap and make wudu. But for you, I'm going to do it. I will do it, Oh Allah. Imagine if you were to die on that day. What do you think your condition will be? Subhanallah. What do you think your condition would be? Oh Allah, I, I love my sleep. You know that, oh Allah. I just fell off to sleep just now. You know, a lot of us are searching for success. And as a result, we become depressed because we've tried out all the other recipes that don't work. And we can't sleep because we're worried. So you go to bed, say at 11 o'clock. 12 o'clock, you're still awake. 1 o'clock, you're still awake. 2 o'clock, you're still awake. 3 o'clock, you're still awake. 4, your eye closes. And guess what? Salatul Fajr is at 5.30. So what happens? You say, Allah is forgiving. He is ghafoorur rahim. He knows that I didn't get sleep. So for me, it's fine. I'll read my qada when I get up. It's okay. I'm sure Allah is okay with that. 
That was a challenge, a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The devil is entrapping you. Your worries will go away when you get used to getting up for that salah and sleeping on time and stop worrying about things. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, if worrying solved our problems, we would have little cubicles and cabins all over the city where people could go inside and worry for 30 minutes, come out and say, my debts are paid. <laughs> worrying does nothing for you. Really, why are you worrying? For what? Worrying didn't ever help anybody. Yes, you can be concerned about things. That's sure. You should be concerned. Do something positive. Leave the rest in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be lazy. Do whatever you can. Leave the rest in the hands of Allah. The same applies for Salatul Fajr and other prayers. Sometimes we say, okay, when I became a Muslim, for example, you know, a person would say, for example, if they didn't know any better, when I became a Muslim, I was taught that Allah is in control of everything. And everything happens only by the permission of Allah. So I'm going to sleep. If Allah wants me to read Fajr, He will wake me up. And if Allah doesn't want me to read Fajr, I'm not going to wake up. So anyway, I'm going to sleep. Bismillah. And we go to sleep. That is foolish. You are responsible. The alarm clock, you are the one who was supposed to put it there. If you were sitting, like we said yesterday, at home and thinking to yourself, I need to get to Al Manar Center. And if Allah has written it for me, I will go. You would still be at home. Like I said yesterday, I hope you're watching on live stream, inshallah. It's a reality. You need to make an effort. Without that effort, you will achieve nothing. That's Allah's plan. MashaAllah, we made the effort, so we are here today. Or we are listening. Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah for that. Similarly, when it comes to your prayer, make an effort. Allah asks you for nothing besides very few things, small, which is an honor for you, a great honor for you. What is the honor? Take a look at it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about salah, He always, always mentions the issue of success. The issue of success with that salah. Amazingly, we said moments ago, if you were to... We said moments ago that if you were to pay for your breath, you wouldn't be able to pay. If you were to pay for your breath, you wouldn't be able to pay. But Allah says, you know what? Just fulfill your salah. Be thankful. Don't be ungrateful. If you are ungrateful, show ingratitude, then definitely what would happen? You would not be able to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your maker, your nourisher, your cherisher. Like I said right at the beginning, the one in absolute control of every aspect of your life and the lives of every other human being and all creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How would we be able to achieve his pleasure? He's asking you something small. Allah gave you 24 hours in the day. Do you agree? He's asking you for 24 minutes of dedication. That is the bare minimum. I'm not saying rush in your prayer. No, but I'm saying the bare minimum. If you were to fulfill just your obligation for the five daily prayers, I don't think it would take you much longer than that. From 24 hours, you are being asked for 24 minutes. Still, we don't give. And we want success and we want happiness and we want goodness. When Allah calls you to success, you don't want to answer. When you start crying to Allah to sort your problems out, you become despondent and you want the response now. Now. Allah called you saying, hey, listen, you know what? Just come and pray. And you said, I'll think about it. I'm not yet ready. I'm still young. I'm only 13. Do you know that? Subhanallah, what an excuse. What an excuse. When Allah called you, you didn't reply. When you call out to Allah, you want Him to reply. Yet you know, you need Him, He does not need you. The equations just simply don't fit. This is why the narration speaks about getting close to Allah at times of ease. Get close to Allah. Get acquainted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during your days of ease. When things are easy going, get close to Allah. And Allah will come close to you during your days of difficulty. When you're in hardship, you will find the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. It will come. Now one might say, okay, I messed up already. I wasn't so close to Allah and I'm already in a problem. What do I do? Thank Allah. Many of us only started praying after there was a problem in our lives. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes. Many of us only became close to the Almighty after we had major issues in our lives that really 
made us ponder and think and turn. This is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why don't always think that the negative that comes in your direction was a punishment. If that negative aspect within your life brought you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was the blessing of Allah. It was the mercy of Allah. Allah tightened the rope a little bit to bring you near. So suddenly you found out you were sick and ill. You had a disease that was very serious and you started crying. And you said, oh Allah, oh Allah, help me. For the first time in your life, you raised your hands to Allah, promised, oh Allah, I forgive my sins. I'm going to fulfill my salah. I'm going to do this and do that. Allah says, you know what? Oh as our love for you, we wanted you to come closer. So we tested you. It's from the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, when Allah loves a worshiper, He puts tests in their lives. So they become closer and closer to Allah. Don't look at the negative things that happen in your life as negative in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are opportunities that need to be seized in order to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to start the fulfillment of your obligations such as the pillar that we are speaking about today and that is the salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us success. So my brothers and sisters, Allah has asked you for very little. Do we confirm that what He has given us and what He asks from us what he asks from us is very little compared to what he's given us. Do you confirm that? Very little. 24 minutes out of 24 hours, for example. And if you want to read a slower prayer, say 48 minutes out of 24 hours. That's not much. You know, on our phones alone today, and I'm speaking of myself included, I'm guilty of the same thing. We spend more time than we should be spending. Do you know that? Every day I tell myself, I want to cut out. Not to say I'm crazy, but at the same time, we can improve. I'm adding myself in the equation to show you that it affects every one of us without exception. Except those who are beyond 75. Inshallah. <laughs> they are the youngest from us at heart, so perhaps they are interested in more important things. But my brothers and sisters, what you need to know is we can always improve. If I'm ready to spend time on the phone, so long with a human being. What about my maker? Can't I spend time with my maker? That is a little bit. Another thing is, can't you put away silent on silent your phone, switch it off for the time you are going to engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is an honor. That is a privilege. That is respect of your own maker, your creator. I'm communicating with Allah. I don't even want this phone to ring. I do not want to communicate with someone else. This might be my last prayer. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Salli salata muwadda'in. Whenever you pray, pray as though it's your last opportunity to pray. After this, you're going to say goodbye and you're going to die. Every prayer should be like that. Do you want to answer that call of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Today we get angry and upset when people draw cartoons, when people make videos against the true image of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We get upset. But we are not interested in listening to what he had to say. We just say we love him and yet we don't follow what he says. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. I'm sure we can do better. I'm sure we can do better when it comes to salah. Dedicate yourself and understand that the solution to your problem is salah. There is a narration regarding Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزِعَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ Whenever anything overtook him, whenever he felt like he was burdened by something, he resorted to salah in order to alleviate that feeling. So he achieved calmness and coolness, comfort and solace. From what? From fulfilling salah, voluntary prayer. With us, even that which is compulsory, we are dilly-dallying. We tell ourselves, okay, you know what? I will do it. I will. That's shaitan's first trap. What's shaitan's first trap? When we say, Oh, I've heard the prayer, the call to the prayer. Wow, okay. And I want to pray. But you know what? There's still two hours remaining for the prayer. I still have time. That's the first step, the first trap of the devil. Because before you know it, two hours and ten minutes have passed. You look at your clock and you say, Oh, the time just ended. Astaghfirullah. That astaghfirullah is not good enough for that moment because you allowed yourself to let the time go past. This is why the hadith says, the best deed you could fulfill is salah upon its time. Do you know in one narration, the Prophet ﷺ actually uses the word, as salatu ala waqtiha, to fulfill the prayer upon its time. 
The linguists as well as the scholars have spoken about the meaning of the term ala. It means upon, on. And what it would mean in this context is salah at its beginning time. As soon as the time comes in, fulfill it. Yesterday we spoke about the splendid seven. Those who, were, who will be granted the shade on the day of Qiyamah, specialized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of them is a person whose heart is hanging in the place of sujood or in the masjid. Someone who fulfills one prayer and they are keen on the next, yet they have just finished this one here. Once I'm finished dhuhr, I'm waiting for asr. Whatever I do, immediately after dhuhr, I'm planning where am I going to make my asr and how and what's going to happen. And immediately after asr, the prayer in the late afternoon, I'm already planning where am I going to make my maghrib. That is a person who deserves a special status on the day of judgment. They were interested in their link with Allah. On the day of judgment, Allah will be interested in his link with them. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. This is salah. The most important pillar of Islam. One narration makes mention of how it is such a strong pillar of Islam. Whoever establishes it will establish the rest of the deen. And whoever drops it will drop the rest of their deen. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? Recite that which has been revealed to you and establish the salah. For indeed, Salah will protect you or Salah prohibits you from immorality and evil. How does Salah protect you from immorality and evil? That's a question. The reality is if you fulfill all your prayers on time and you are in the condition of ablution known as wudu, the ablution that we fulfill before we pray. We need to make sure we've arrived at a certain level of purity before we actually pray. If you fulfill that properly and you are interested in the next one and the next one, do you really think you will be able to commit adultery between the two? If your heart is already connected to the next prayer, you're going to tell yourself, no ways, I need to get to salah. Do you think you'll be able to be vulgar? You've been speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you think you will be able to be vulgar and you start swearing and screaming and yelling? Yet you are a person whose tongue is always moist with the words of Allah. The answer is no. So if you are vulgar or if you engage in immoral behavior, there is something wrong with your prayer. There is something wrong with the way you are praying. You know, sometimes what people do is, they are found in the first saf in the masjid. They are found reading a lot of salah. They read so much of prayer. But when they come out of the masjid or even in the masjid, they are backbiting, they slander, they cheat, they deceive. They don't have any consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but physically they fulfill that salah. So one of the scholars was asked about this. You see the person who is outwardly so pious, and yet they backbite and they usurp the rights of others. You know what he said? There is a possibility that Allah has used him to do deeds for someone else. So if I was backbiting you, my good deeds are gone to you. Allah used me to give you a bonus. This is why I never get depressed when people backbite about me. I always say, Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. If they haven't backbitten about you, there's something wrong. Maybe you don't have anything. Like we always say, when people are not jealous of you, you should be worried. Because it means you have nothing that's a big deal. The minute you have something that's a big deal, people will say things. People will talk. People will accuse. People will utter. Thank Allah, they've got something to talk about, man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. You are successful in any way. People will talk about you. Even if you are successful by fulfilling your salah, people will say, this guy is arrogant. He just comes and he fights for coming to the first stuff because he wants to show off. There's nothing to do with showing off. But if that comes to your ears, don't let it make you despondent. No. Thank Allah. No problem. Let them talk. Oh Allah, this salah is for you. You know that. Subhanallah. Amazing. And this is why we say, my brothers and sisters, if your salah is not in order, there is 
there will be something wrong in your life. And if something is wrong in your life, perhaps your salah is not in order. I'm talking of immorality, vulgar uh, words that come out of the mouth, backbiting and, and deception. If you are really concerned about your prayer, you will not be able to engage in those sins because you will know my connection is with Allah. I don't need to connect myself to the devil. May Allah make us steadfast. We see so many issues occurring across the globe. People are searching for happiness, contentment. People are searching for any form of goodness. And wallahi, the goodness begins with your link with your maker. That's where the goodness begins. You cannot start off somewhere else. You need to start off with your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the hadith speaks of how success is for he who fulfills his salah upon the beginning of its time. Upon the beginning of its time. Don't delay and see the difference. How many of us have got up for Salatul Fajr? And this is an example you will relate to. If you have got up for Salatul Fajr early and you've made your wudu and you were calm and you were not in a rush and you were not interested in your phone and you laid down your little mat that you were fulfilling your salah upon and you decided to start off with the two raka'at of salah you know salatul fajr they are preceded with two units of sunnah those two units the hadith says raka'ata al fajri khayrun min ad dunya wa ma fiha those two units that precede the compulsory two units of salatul fajr they are known as sunnah of fajr they are better than the whole world and whatever it contains. Don't rush. Read it nicely. Get up no matter what and tell yourself, you know what? I need a job. I need this. I'm struggling. I don't have enough money. I'm about to get kicked out from here. I have this problem, that problem. But these two raka'at, they are better than what the whole world has to offer collectively. Here I am. And you start for the sake of Allah. So when we get up in that way, and when we then fulfill Salatul Fajr and thereafter sit and praise Allah for a little while and even if you go back to bed after that, it's not wrong. If you want to start off your day, it's better. But if you are early or something of that nature, you're tired, you want to go back to bed, tell me, don't you feel so proud of yourself that I fulfilled my Salatul Fajr in a beautiful way today. When the brothers make an effort to go out to the nearest masjid, Wallahi, you are so fortunate in this beautiful city and this beautiful country. You have masjid upon masjid. If not here, it's down the road. If it's not down the road, it's down the other road. Subhanallah. Make use of it. These are the houses of Allah. You would be so honored if you were allowed to visit the house of your hero. Subhanallah or the house of an important person, but you have an open invitation. People are yelling at the top of their voices on a microphone, inviting you to the house of he who made you from nothing. And you're not going. This is why the hadith speaks of the curse upon a person who hears the call to prayer and he doesn't respond. Or the sin upon that person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who respond to the call. This is success. And then what happens to us is, okay, we start our prayer. Okay, fine, I'm here. Allahu Akbar. And we start. And the next thing, the mind goes somewhere else. So now the, the thought actually starts moving, distancing. And the first thing we start thinking about is my phone. You know, I know what happens to some of the brothers because some of them have told me that, you know, when the Imam is taking a little bit too long, you know what happens? We start thinking, I put my phone on silent. I wonder, how, I wonder how many missed calls I have. We start thinking missed calls. I wonder who called me. Oh, my phone is on vibrate. It's vibrating in my pocket. All this is from the devil. No concentration. Why? There is a reason. And I'm going to get to that reason. You want to help yourself regarding concentration in salah? Yes, there's a recipe. And we will show you the recipe, inshallah. Because the thoughts, you know, there was once a man, I'm sure you've heard the story before. I've mentioned it before as well. There was a man who uh, told the Imam after Salatul Isha that, look guy, I want to tell you something. He says, what's wrong? He says, you have only read three raka'at. The Imam says, no, I'm quite sure I read four. He says, no, you only read three. He says, what makes you so certain? 
The whole masjid was full. There were so many people. You're the only guy telling me that I made three, yet I made four. He says, look, 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 look. I have got four branches of my shop. And I do the accounts of each branch in every rakah. I only did three. And you said, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. So the Imam was fascinated because he says, what about the rest of the people who didn't even pick this up? The point I'm raising is the lack of concentration, how we allow our minds to wander. We allow it. Sometimes people enjoy going into prayer because they say, at least I can sit and think for a while. I can sit and I can think what I'm going to do. Okay. And you know, so on. I remember my little son, he told me that on one occasion, when we were taking a little bit long with the salah and the food was actually prepared and he was thinking to himself, this food is going to get cold. We're going to carry on. And he says, you know what? You're right. You're right. Sometimes we do wonder. We start thinking, hey, this is taking too long. The food's going to get cold there. I don't want to eat cold food. Relax, relax. Your salah comes first. Your link with Allah. You might never ever live to eat the food. Do you know that? You might not live to eat the food. I'd rather die in this condition than to die in that. And had you wanted, and if there was enough time, you could have actually started off with that if it was really desperate and you were really hungry. And if there was enough time, and then you could have read your salah calm, relaxed. You know, sometimes people need the bathroom. And what happens is they decide, no, let me hold, let me hold it in for a while. I'll pray and then I will go. It depends how desperate you are. And I'm honest with you, I'm saying it openly because there's nothing to hide. It happens to a lot of us sometimes. It depends. If you are quite desperate, take it easy. Go to the bathroom. Repeat your wudu, come back and fulfill your salah in a relaxed fashion. How would you like it if someone came for a meeting with you and they say, Salaam Alaikum, how are you doing? Are you fine? Are you okay? And you know, you can see that this man is agitated, something's wrong. And I'm supposed to be talking to him for about 10 minutes. And you say, brother, something wrong. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. And he keeps on moving up and down. What's the problem? You want to read Salah, Allahu Akbar, you're supposed to be standing calm. When you stand for the sake of Allah, stand with total, with total calmness, with quietness, with concentration, without all these movements. You're not supposed to be talking, you're not supposed to be fidgeting, all that is not allowed. Salah is also part of your discipline. Look, in Islam we are taught to lower our gaze, right? You're taught to lower your gaze. In Salah, you're taught to look at the position where your face or your head will probably be when you go down to prostrate. So when you say Allahu Akbar, your eyes should be low. Your eyes should be looking down. That's the proper way of doing things. Don't you think that if you were to discipline yourself to look down in one position five times a day for the entire prayer, you only looked where Allah wanted you to look. So it would make your life easier to be able to look where Allah wants you to look outside your salah as well. Do you understand the point? If I could look at one spot for salah, surely when I see something wrong, I can, look, I can quickly look down for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we say immorality. Salah will help you and protect you because it trained you. You know, in Salah, you're not supposed to move unless you really have to do something, but you're supposed to stand as calm as possible. Not even your feet. You're supposed to stand exactly as calm as possible. So if you can stand in one spot for Salah without moving, don't you think if you did it correctly, you would be able to protect your feet from walking towards the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of salah? Well, it requires discipline. These are some of the perks, the fringe benefits of salah. But let's get back to that issue of concentration. The verses that were read of Surah Al-Mu'minun just before we started. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, successful are the believers. So Allah wants to now describe who those believers are. A lot of us say, I'm a Muslim, but our behavior is not like Islam. It's not like Muslims. Take a look at those people perpetrating injustices, immorality, perpetrating killings across the globe in the name of Islam, the religion of peace. What's happening? That's not the religion of peace. That's not what Islam teaches. So with us, sometimes we call ourselves Muslim, but we haven't yet submitted. 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to improve. We need to submit correctly. So when Allah says, successful are the believers, you know, we can't just say, mashallah, mashallah, I'm successful. Look, I'm a believer. I call myself a mu'min. And Allah says, mu'minin are successful. That's it. I'm successful. Wait, 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 wait. Allah describes who they are. Who is he referring to? الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those whom in their prayer, they read with khushu'a. Khushu'a is a combination not only of humbleness, humility and so on, but the concentration, the plug-in with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that leads you to become, it leads you to focus. That is the khushu'a that we're speaking about here. So Allah says, those who are focused in their prayer. So one might ask, how can I focus in my prayer? That's a question. Well, let's look at the next verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those who give up that which is vain, that which is unnecessary, you give it up. What's the connection? Well, the connection is one verse was mentioned after the other, but I can tell you that if you were to give up that which is vain, unnecessary, whether it is, uh, you know, just a chit chat that is absolutely unnecessary. Imagine if you are to give up that which is unnecessary, then giving up sin is far more important. So if you're just sitting and laughing throughout the middle of the night, doing nothing, talking about anything and everything without any importance, what will happen? Let me explain. You know the latest phone? What's it called? The iPhone 6S Plus, right? Do you agree? Maybe 7. Coming out in April, I was told. Okay. But at the same time, when you buy it, what do you have to look at? You have to look at the size of the phone. It, the same now applies to Samsung. Do you agree? Where you can no longer put in your extra little chip, you know, the SD card. No longer. It no longer applies with the new phones. You have to have the phone that has the memory. So which would be the ideal phone for you? 16 gigs? How many? 64. Wow, not 16, isn't it? 16, you just say hello and it's full, right? One, two WhatsApp messages and it's over, right? I tell you, your brain and my brain works in a similar way. We also have gigabytes, terabytes, whatever other bytes you have here which don't really bite. I don't know why they call it bites. But you have a capacity in your brain when that is filled with so many things. You know what happens? Learn from your phone. When you have so many videos, so many pictures, so many things that have been processed in your phone, when you tap your phone, it's slow to respond, right? You think there's a virus, but there's no virus. You have just packed up unnecessary things. So someone will tell you, listen, sit with your phone and delete that which is not necessary. Agree? So now you start deleting, deleting, deleting this. Do I need it? No, I don't. Delete, delete, delete. Everything gone. Now you tap your phone, it responds. You tap your phone, it responds. Why? That which was unnecessary, you took it out. The same applies to you and your mind. When you have unnecessary images, you've been watching pornography. Pornography takes up so many gigabytes in your mind and it lasts for so long, it encrypts itself behind, it comes back to haunt you even after you've made tawbah. Sometimes you, you are praying and an image comes into your head, Astaghfirullah, how dare! But that's what happened. You damaged your hard drive here and you know what? It's only 64 gigs. You needed 128. Allahu Akbar. So, you had so many unnecessary images, messages, phone calls, people that you were dealing with, you know, so much in terms of haram relationships and you spent hours and hours on end doing things. What happened? When you say Allahu Akbar, by the time you realize what you're doing, you're already saying Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Your phone did not respond. Meaning your brain, your mind, your computer didn't really register what exactly you were doing. But when you are anillahwi mu'ridun, when you turn away from that which is vain and futile, unnecessary, when you say Allahu Akbar, your mind is with the meaning. Allah is the greatest. Who is Allah? The worshipped one. Who is the worshipped one? The one who made me. So I am effectively saying, he who made me is the greatest. Indeed, he is the greatest. That's what I said. Look at the salah. And I'm so happy. And then I start off with my istiftah, the dua that you read. And then I start off by Surah Al-Fatiha. I say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Not just lip service. We have a problem. What's the problem? Because we know Surah Al-Fatiha of my heart. Do you know what happens? 
We read it without even thinking what we're reading. Myself included sometimes, where the concentration can always be better. None of us can say, I have 100% concentration, because nobody does. That is the battle. The battle is to improve. So when you had 1% concentration and now you've got to 10, mashallah, big, big improvement, alhamdulillah. Imagine if you got to 50% concentration, wow, mashallah, you've achieved something huge, big. So learn my brothers and sisters to leave that which is futile. You know, some people are so, so interested in the scores of football. I'm not saying it's wrong, but the depth of your interest would determine whether it is healthy or unhealthy. Some people know the names and the surnames of the people and their girlfriends and they, how many times they scored and their hairstyles and what they did and where they went and how they shopped and every single player and they'll name 10 players and they'll know this and know that. And absolutely every detail, where they scored, how much they scored, who was the manager, when he was fired, why he was fired, what did he say when he was fired, what did the press say? <sighs> they know everything, subhanAllah. But when they come, Allahu Akbar, their mind is with a football player. <laughs> because... I'm not saying it's wrong to follow a little bit here and there. We are human beings. Yes, we have a social life. We might want to participate in sport. You might want to do a little bit. But remember, there is a limit to everything. There is a limit. Understand your limits. That's all I'm saying. Understand. If you don't understand your limit, it's going to impact and effect negatively on some other aspect of your life. Perhaps your family might be, what can I say? Completely ignored. You, you've ignored them totally. Your family. But you have got so much time for that which is not even half as important as your family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So this is where the issue of khashi'un comes into play. Those who can concentrate in salah, those who are focused in their prayer. How will you attain focus? According to what I've learned, when you start removing unnecessary things. So your hard drive has necessary items, perhaps a little bit here and there because we are human beings, but you have concentration, you have focus. You leave things in the hands of Allah. When you say Allahu Akbar, everything else can wait. Everything else can wait. This is why I say, your phone must be on silent. It must be before your salah. Even if you've missed a very important call, no problem. This that you are engaging in now is far more important. It will be understood if you were to die in this condition. So how am I able to abstain or to protect myself from how am I able to protect myself from that which is futile? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ Those who do their zakah. فَاعِلُونَ فَعَلَ means to do. Those who do their zakah. Yes, it primarily means those who establish the alms to the poor. No doubt. Zakah, you and I know, it is referring to alms to the poor, to give charities. Those who are charitable, those who can give, their heart is not so clinging to that which is material, to the degree that it preoccupies them. No, they can give. You love something and you've given it, I've given it out, mashallah. I know that my love for Allah comes before my love for these gadgets and these items that the rest of the world is running after, alhamdulillah. But over and above that, the term zakah also refers to cleansing yourself. Those who work hard on their qualities, your qualities, you need to work hard on them. Tazkiyah to nafs to cleanse your nafs, to work on your own nafs, that is also included in the term zakah. Because you have now cleansed yourself. So you need to work hard. For example, a person who has a temper, that temper is not just going to disappear. You need to work hard to combat it, to eradicate it. A lot of us here, we become very angry, but only with those who are weak. So at home, we scream and yell. And when we go to work, what happens? They're silent because we know I might be fired. How can you vent your frustration upon the weakest of the weak? In your own home, those who are most vulnerable, the softest spot. And you're so angry and you utter things like they don't have family members. They don't have an Allah to look after them. How dare you yell at your wife or your husband? You know, I left Zimbabwe a few days ago and there was an article on the back page. And you know what it said? The incidence of women being violent against men have increased by so many percentage, by so much. 
And I promised myself that in every lecture when I speak about men becoming violent, I will also speak about women becoming violent. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May Allah make it easy. I know the protein really does help and the weights, they do help, mashallah. But my brothers and sisters, the issue is don't do that. Don't get angry with those who you are supposed to be closest to your children and the others. Be patient. Be, Allah will be patient with you. You be patient with them and Allah will be patient with you. You want a quality from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's goodness, you need to embody that particular quality in a small way at least as a human being. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. This is taken from the narration, Man la yarham la yurham. Whoever does not show mercy will not be shown mercy. Irhamu man fil ardi, yarhamkum man fil samai. Have mercy upon those on earth, the one in the heavens will have mercy on you. Quite simple. So inshallah, to cleanse yourself, to be able to work on your bad qualities, your habits, work hard. If you want to quit gambling, you want to quit adultery, you want to quit pornography, you want to quit drugs, you want to quit so many other sins, you need to work hard on that. It's not just going to come like that. Pray hard to Allah together with the effort. Make sure you are in good company. Stop yourself from going when you are so tempted to go. If you stop yourself a hundred times, inshallah, it will become habitual for you not to go. But if you don't work hard, don't think you are going to solve the problem. Many people, subhanallah, they're involved in so many habits that no one knows besides them. And they want to be helped and they even sometimes reach out to help for help. But they do not do that which will help them. And that is, subhanallah, you need to be hard on yourself. You definitely need to be hard on yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. And then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ A beautiful verse where Allah speaks about those who protect their private parts. Those who protect their private parts, they are the ones. Now I want to take it back. You protect your private parts, you will be able to cleanse yourself. You cleanse yourself, you will be able to concentrate in prayer. You concentrate in prayer, you will be able to achieve success that is written for a believer. You see how we're going backwards. It's amazing. Recipe to success. What is it? Your salah. You want your salah to be in order, you need to protect yourself from immorality. Allah says it clearly. Those who protect their private parts. The Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man wa man I can guarantee paradise to he who guarantees me the correct use of what lies between his cheeks, meaning his tongue, and what lies between his thighs, meaning his private parts. So if you guarantee me that you're going to use those two things correctly, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I guarantee you paradise. Wow, it sounds quite simple. It's the most difficult thing ever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. The tongue, the tongue is something we are so cutting with it. And I spoke about that moments ago. So my brothers and sisters, what a beautiful explanation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, you will be able to fulfill your base desires, but only with that which is permissible from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing. Your wives, your husbands, you will be married. You will be able to achieve fulfillment of your desire through the halal channels. And that's when you'll be able to concentrate. You'll be happy. No regrets. Nothing to be sad about. You are happy. And in order to be able to be, listen very carefully. In order to be able to be in control of your private parts, you need to be a trustworthy person. You know, when your husband or your wife tells you, the trust is broken. I can no longer trust you. I don't know. I've got trust issues. Have you heard that statement before? Trust issues. Why trust issues? Because they saw a message on your phone. Sorry to talk about a phone. You know, the other day a friend of mine told me, why do you always speak about phones? Well, what can I do? More and more of us have got phones and more and more of these phones have become sophisticated. So it's probably the best example you're ever going to give for now. And suddenly you're so secretive and you're hiding with everything your messages. You've got something to hide. That's your spouse. Hey, you touched my phone. You know what? Fingerprint, fingerprint. I know a man who has a, a toe print. <laughs> well, may Allah forgive us. A toe print. So even in his sleep, when his wife tries to tamper, tamper, she doesn't get through. And when he wakes up, he just puts it on his toe. And next thing, he's on his phone. 
You've got something to hide. If that's the case, how are you going to concentrate in your prayer? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I'm not joking by the way, it's something true. So, if you are trustworthy, you will be able to protect yourself by the will of Allah. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ Those who are considerate of their pledge, and at the same time, amanat, that which you are entrusted with. You fulfill the trust of that which you are entrusted with. Notice the word trust comes in once again. And if you were to flick backwards the verses that we were reading, you would understand there is somehow some connection between these verses as a recipe of success for the believers. And it all goes back to salah. And this is why after that Allah ends with salah. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ Those who protect the quantity of prayer. The word salawat is used at the end. Salawat here referring to what? The plural of salah. The plural of prayer. Why is it that at the beginning, Allah, Allah uses the term salah. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ And at the end, Allah uses the term salawat. It's the plural. What's the difference? Some of the scholars have made mention of an interesting point. They say, if you look carefully, you will pick up that the first one is speaking of the quality and the last one is speaking of the quantity. So when you're talking of quantity, you're talking of the plural. And when you're talking of quality, you're talking of something singular. And I want to now inform you of something even more interesting. And that is, initially when you become regular with your prayer initially when you become regular with your prayer your concentration might not be where it's supposed to be so what are you concentrating on i'm concentrating on getting the prayer done i'm still concentrating on fighting my nafs in order to be able to get up but i'm still not concentrating on the salah itself as much as i should so i got my five done i'm so happy wow i read my five salah today i read my five salah the next day and the next day and the next day mashallah 40 days have passed four months have passed and i'm so thankful to allah alhamdulillah i haven't missed a single salah now you need to progress graduate to the next level what is it start improving the quality of your prayer the quality of it if you improve the quality of your prayer by the will of allah you will now arrive at a new level and that is the level which would depict success in a believer. So when I know that now inshallah, I'm close to what Allah has asked me to do, when I concentrate and I can concentrate in salah, when the Imam is reading, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, we are concentrating on what it means and we are smiling, we are calm, most beneficent, most merciful, owner of the day of judgment. You alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not the path of those who have gone astray or earned your anger and so on. Or earned your anger and gone astray. We're concentrating on what is being said. And we're so happy. That is getting somewhere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to achieve this. My brothers and sisters, in the name of Allah, in the name of Allah, we begin this new page in our lives where we will take it very seriously. The issue of prayer, the issue of salah. We are really facing a lot of struggles across the globe. The solution starts with your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said that earlier. And to be honest, it is. One day I told a group of youngsters that you know what? You want solution to your problems? It's in salah. Three days later, the young man comes to me. He says, look, ever since you told me, I started my salah, but there is still no solution. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Three days. In three days. For 30 years, you didn't read your prayers. And now that you started in three days, your solution has come. You think your solution is going to come? Three days. Wait. Dedicate a lifetime to Allah. Your solution will come when Allah knows it's best for you. Not enough tears have rolled down your cheeks yet for the sake of Allah. Perhaps Allah knows. So I will read my salah, I will continue with it and I will have hope and conviction in my heart that Allah will provide the solutions. That's when I will be able to achieve goodness. Subhanallah. And speaking about Bismillah, you know in the name of Allah, we always start in the name of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. I give you something that you can take home and remember inshallah. Something that the, the youngsters would probably enjoy. So these two youngsters learnt at the madrasa 
that whatever you do, you need to say Bismillah. You know there is a hadith, كل عمل ذي بال لم يبتدأ فيه بسم الله فهو أقطع. There is a narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says, anything important that you start off without Bismillah will be cut off from the blessings. So anything important you're going to do, you say Bismillah. So much so that we are taught. You eat, you say Bismillah. You open the door of your car, you say Bismillah. You enter the house, Bismillah. You exit, Bismillah. Everything is in the name of Allah. So these two kids, they learned this at the madrasa. And when they got home, the one kid went into the fridge and he took out the water and he's busy drinking. He wants to drink and as he's about to put the cup to his mouth, his brother tells him, hey, 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 wait, 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 you need to say Bismillah. And he says, but this is only water. I'm only drinking water. He says, so what? You're only drinking water. You have to say Bismillah. He says, but it's not food. It's not, it's just water. I have to drink the water. Didn't you hear that anything important you're doing, you have to say Bismillah. So the child says, I'm not convinced. Give me a good reason why. Now the other one is intelligent and he's thinking, thinking hard. And then he comes up with something. He says, right, right let me tell you why. Why you got to say Bismillah? He says, okay, tell me. He says, because in water, there are three jinns. Three jinns. Now, you know, when you and I hear about jinn, we get excited. If I were to tell you there are jinns right here, right now, I think we'd help the skelter. There'd be a stampede here. If I say there's a jinn, there's a noise that comes from that angle and this angle. You know, in winter, by the way, some of our ceilings and, and you know, some of the wooden uh, parts of our house, there's expansion and contraction and you can hear a little crackle in the foundations or somewhere. And people actually think that there is a jinn. And they actually go to people and they say, there's a jinn in my house and so on. Wallahi, we're used to that. That's just expansion, contraction. Subhanallah. I remember one day I was called to someone's house. Don't worry about the story. I'm coming back to the water story, okay? <laughs> one day I was called to someone's house and they told me there's definitely a jinn that's in love with my daughter. And I was like, wow, how do you know? He says, you have to come to my house in the evening at a specific time. I said, but what makes you so sure? He says, she sits and she just, her eyes just start rolling and she's so happy and she's smiling. And I said, cannot be. Anyway, in order to help him, I went to his house. Exactly that time, 6.30 in the evening. And I'm sitting somewhere. And you know what? There's a beautiful smell that comes in. And he says, you see the smell, it's beautiful. I said, yes. Do you smell it? Yes, that's a gin. I said, is it a jinn? He said, yes. And my daughter loves the smell. And she goes, you know, almost hallucinates with the smell. I said, wow, okay, let's see. So I got up and we decided to walk around the garden. And guess what? There was a rose bush right next to the window there. Subhanallah. There were flowers, beautiful flowers in the African weather that you have blossoming and letting out such a lovely scent. And the wind just blows at that time of the evening during the season and it was coming in. Look at how man quickly blames the jinn, subhanallah. Anything, the problem is a jinn. <laughs> no way, relax, it's not a jinn. It's something. Even when the belly aches, you say, I think I have a jinn. What's that? So this boy says, you want to drink the water, you have to say Bismillah. So the guy says, why? He says, because in water there are three jinns. He says, what do you mean? He says, two hydrogen and one oxygen. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So yes, to protect yourself from those jinn, you need to know, Bismillah is the solution. I leave you with one thing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in His name, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala change us to become better people. May Allah help us develop the good qualities we have. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us reach out to one another. When your salah is in order, when your acts of worship are in order, when you are closer to Allah, it shows by you becoming humble towards fellow human beings. When a person is very respectful to other human beings, you must know perhaps this person is close to Allah. Because these are the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made by Allah. He has rights that you need to fulfill regarding these creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are walking with haughtiness and arrogance on earth, it means you are distant from the one who made you and them. What brings me and you together?
What's the connection between us? Wallahi, the minimum we could say is he who made me made you. So you are part of my family and I'm part of yours. We are connected, Wallahi. I have rights that need to be fulfilled and so do you. So if I am, co am conscious of the rights I need to fill regarding you because I understand we have a common maker, it indeed shows that I'm close to that maker and I'm concerned about my relationship with him because I respect everything else that he has made. This is why... When I, whenever I see a person who's humble, down to earth, I take a moment to talk to them, to greet them. And I try my best to understand what is the motivating force behind such a big person. And they're so humble, for example. They're so calming. A lot of the times it's because they are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us all. I say it once again. Brothers and sisters, let's learn to reach out to one another. I want to acknowledge those from amongst you. Those from amongst you who have taken the time to come here this evening. Perhaps you are sitting in a very awkward position due to the great numbers. May Allah bless you. Those of you who perhaps you might be CEOs, big VIPs, like I said yesterday, people who are so busy, you've made the time and you've actually made an effort to be here this evening. May Allah bless you in every way and your families and those who are listening to us and those who may listen later on. May Allah bless you all. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, it's important for us to acknowledge that in our presence, there are people who may be struggling with certain aspects of their lives. We pray for all of them. Learn to pray for others. Perhaps through that prayer, the angels make a prayer that is similar for you and you might achieve alleviation in the suffering that you have. So I pray for you. May Allah bless you, alleviate your suffering, grant you cure from the sickness you may be having. May Allah bless you, have mercy on those who are deceased from your family members who deserve the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us all together in the most beautiful of places in paradise. And inshallah, we hope that even before that, we get to meet one another once again. Brothers and sisters, it's only been an honor and a pleasure to be here. I hope these few words have benefited myself first and then every one of us. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.